Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Hello to everybody online. Thank you for joining us. We're about to start, so if you could please find your seats, that'd be great. Uh, I'm going to be reading this morning from Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting at verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were fewest of all the peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. So just previous to that, he had been telling him, hey, when I clear out the land before you, when I clear out all these seven nations who are bigger than you and mightier than you, by the way, they're bigger than you, they can destroy you. When I clear them out and I make the way and you destroy them, like he does all the work and then we destroy them. Uh, when you go in, don't make any covenants with, covenants with them, destroy everything that they have set up to their gods. Don't keep anything up and don't intermarry with them. Why? Because, not because he hated those people, but because it'll cause your sons and your daughters to not follow me anymore. And you're a holy people. You belong to me. I chose you because I loved you, because I wanted you. So when you come before the Lord this morning, know he chose you, not because you were really big and strong or talented or beautiful or handsome or any other thing, which some of you really are those things. Um, but because he, he saw you and he loved you and he wants you to be one of his holy people. He wants a people who are his, who love him completely because that's how we're made. We're created by the holy almighty God and he knows how he created us. He knows our operating system and he knows that we're, we're supposed to operate best when we're connected with him and we know him. So this morning, that's why I invite you to do to remember that he chose you. He loves you. And he calls you to do some things because he loves you and he wants you to be completely his. So Jesus, this morning, we thank you that we can come and worship you. We thank you that we can come and adore you and lift up and glorify your name. It's such an honor and a blessing and a privilege to be able to do that. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. Fill us up. Overflow us. Come and do what you want to do, Holy Spirit. Come and have your way here and glorify the name of Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Would you stand and worship with us this morning? We haven't done this one in a little while, but if you feel like you want to come out of your seats into the aisle, down to the front, and dance a little bit, get a little rowdy, please feel free to do that. Um, yeah, so... sounds a new beginning as distant hearts begin to leave redemption's bid is unrelenting your love goes on your love goes on
God, you've done great things. Worship our King. 
sheep up. And they put them in a fold where they're safe. And uh, sometimes, you know, shepherds have sheep dogs. And so it says here, surely goodness, goodness, that's what we're singing. Goodness is running after, but it's not just chasing you. Kindly and graciously bringing you back home. His goodness, his love is so constant. He, he doesn't slap you when you do something wrong. That's not. He follows you with goodness. Amen. And he's bringing good things in your life, and we've not thanked him for them enough. But he's not just making us go around in circles. He's bringing us home because it says, well, follow me. And I will return is the word. It's not, it, we translate it, we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But it, that two mistakes, it doesn't say forever. It says through length of days, through all my life. And it doesn't say uh, dwell, it says return. So, goodness and mercy, following you like sheep dogs to return you to the house of the Lord and that's the worship of God to bring you back home so that's what he's been doing he's gathering you up and those friends that you can sing it for someone else that's far from God but he's not far from them he sees them they may be lost but they're not lost to him so sing it for someone else if you can't sing it for yourself let's celebrate the goodness of God bringing us home to worship Goodness is running after, it's running after me.
We're here for him and his glory. Jesus, we are here for you and your kingdom. So we invite you and your government into this city. We invite your government into this house. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be your sign. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you. To you our hearts are open.
together and just ask him to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Oh. Uh. 
Be seated. Thank you. I wasn't sure if that was announcements or a prophetic word coming up. So. Can't tell. Can't tell here. Good morning, Hope Chapel. It's good to see you all. We have a very special ceremony that we do several times a year here at Hope Chapel called Parent Child Dedication. This is a service that we've done some work behind the scenes building up to it with a class where we meet and pray with the parents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain why we do this. And then uh, after a little bit of that, I'm going to bring the families up. We're going to bring um, a liturgy up on the screen with words that you guys can follow along with. And then I'm going to have Hala um, close that section with an encouragement and a prayer. So why do we do... I'm going to step up here. I don't know if that's helpful. Why do we do parent-child dedications? Because children are a gift from the Lord worth celebrating and taking time to mark as a community their role. God gives us children, and we as parents have a holy task. Just thinking about how earlier my daughter was singing about the Lord as father, and I was thinking, oh, man, my role in her life is, a, is her first impression with that word. And there's a reason why Paul the Apostle gives such strong language to fathers not to be harsh with their children. Because our Heavenly Father isn't. And we give our kids an impression. It's like the first preachment of the gospel to little people is the way we treat them in their childhood. That's a preachment. I don't, I don't know if preachment's a word, but there it is. It is a word. <laughs> Let it be so. Okay. Children are not a burden to be destroyed or to be hurt, seen and not heard, whatever, to be one verb and not the other. But, but it is a serious joy for us to raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up the families at this point, but I'm going to read to you a little bit from Deuteronomy 6. Um, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. This is something that we do, we embrace as a lifestyle. When we, when we dedicate the children, we're not just dedicating them, we're dedicating the parents 
as a family where they're making a commitment to raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we as a community are also making a commitment to them as prayer support as a community and all kinds of other things. So why don't we have the two families come forward? It's the Lermas and the Mates. And I reserve space for you right up here. Let's welcome them. Okay, so why don't you come right up here in front of the stage, because we're going to have people support you right behind you, and then that'll give them some space. We can see them. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you for coming up. All right. Let's see here. Um, I think we, this is good, right? Yeah, there's room. Now, if you are family to the mates or Lermas, can you come join them? This, was, this, is, this is the reason why we saved some space for you. We want family to come up. And you could, you could sort of gather around them up on the stage. You can touch the stage. That's right. Now, if you're close friends as well, like in a small group, or if you consider them loved ones, you can also come. I just wanted to give the family a head start. You know what I mean? Family deserves a head start. And some of us brought a lot of family. I'm not going to point fingers, but... <laughs> Now, here at Hope Chapel, we have another category. If you just want to be on stage, you can also join. <laughs> you could just kind of stand. You can stand behind either family. There you go. Okay, good. That's important. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to grab the mic that's actually behind this clan. I should have thought of this. I didn't think ahead. Can I grab this? All right. We're not going to introduce everyone on stage, but I do have this handheld mic. I'm going to give it to you guys, and you can introduce your immediate family and, and the child you're dedicating, and then we're also going to use this uh, mic later for when Hala does a blessing. So is that, we'll start here. Aaron. Hi, my name is Aaron Lerma. This is my wife, Cynthia, and this is our baby. Her name's Alethea, and I just wanted to say quickly, Alethea, we chose that name because it means it's from the Greek word for truth, and her middle name is Tyndale, which is a family name on Cynthia's side. So we wanted to just um, have her name point to the truth, Jesus being the truth, and God's word being the truth. So I have my, uh, a lot of my family here, my parents and Cynthia's parents and some aunts and cousins and uncles and things. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Nathan, do you have a hand? I do. Okay. Good morning. My name is Nathan Mates. This is my wife, my wife Andrea, uh, my eldest daughter Lillian Sonnen Mates, my son, uh, middle son Daniel Wei Un Mates. Uh, and this is, we are dedicating Thomas Nian and Mates. Um, and the common syllable in their middle names, uh, is from the Chinese for grace. Oh, cool. So, uh, and my dad is uh, visiting in town. Uh, the other three grandparents, hello from the past, uh, when you watch on the live stream. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we thank you for joining us. Okay, and thank you for everybody um, getting in place. I think we're good to go. So we're going to have uh, a liturgy with three parts. Um, I'm going to say the leader part and um, the parents. I want you guys to say the parents part. And then the congregation, I want us to say congregation part. Okay. So as long as we, we all know our lines. We got it. OK, we got it. All right. So I think we can pull that up on the screen now. God has entrusted you with a magnificent responsibility to raise these children to the maturity to maturity in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We lovingly accept this responsibility. We will support you in this task. I'm going to go ahead and just say, you guys are doing great. That was plenty loud. I can understand you. So we're off to a good start. Okay. But if not, we could just start the whole thing over. <laughs> Joking. God has given you the gift of life. You are to commit your best in time, resources, and energy to bring these children into adulthood. We will protect and nurture this life. We will help you. Nice. Okay, good. Very good. God expects you to raise a child through the example of a godly life as well as instruction from the word of life. We will strive to live lives consistent with God's word before our child and to instruct our child in the word of God. We will provide godly examples before the child as well. All right, I'm going to remind you all. Like all sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, 
a child is bent towards sin. We dedicate ourselves to teaching the ways of Christ to our child and to helping our child discover the gospel of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. We will join you in this work. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we give these little lambs to you. We pray that they will one day know you as their great shepherd and that they will not be left in need. Lord, make them to lie down in green pastures. May you lead them beside the still waters. Restore their souls. May you lead them into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may they fear no evil, for you are with them. May your rod and your staff comfort them. May you prepare a table before them in the presence of their enemies. May you anoint their head with oil. Amen. Amen. All right. At this point, I'm going to welcome Hala Tompkins, who's our children's ministry director, up to, to lead a, a comment and a blessing. So let's welcome Hala. Good morning. Um, I am Hala. I do get to lead the children's ministries, and this is one of my very favorite things to get to do. And oh my goodness, are these babies not cute? <laughs> so, and I just want to reiterate what Matt said that this is actually more of a dedication service for the parents than these babies who won't remember this day at all. But the parents are making a very big commitment, and we as a congregation are also making a very big commitment. So I encourage us all to do all we can to keep it. <clears throat> now, when you look at these two little people, you may think they have little in common, but they actually have one significant thing in common. Both of their mothers longed for them. Baby Thomas is kind of a laugh out loud Isaac longing, a surprise for a mom whose heart was still ready to have another baby. And here he is. And little Alethea is the answer to Cynthia's years of longing to be a mommy. And isn't she lovely? Both of these babies can remind us all that God hears the spoken and unspoken desires of our hearts. And he gives good gifts. And children are one of his best gifts. So, of course, I'm reminded of Hannah who prayed and prayed and prayed, and then she gave back to the Lord the baby God had given her. And she said, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord. So, Hope Chapel, I want to reiterate that the desire to marry and have children is good. Let's continue to support and care for our families who are in the middle of raising children to know and love Jesus. It's so busy, it's exhausting, and it's so good. So let's all pray for these families now. Lord God, thank you for Nathan and Andrea, for Cynthia and Aaron. Thank you for these beautiful children you've given them. And thank you for this opportunity for them to publicly declare their intention to raise these babies in the discipline and instruction that comes from you. And thank you that you have given them all they need to raise these children in ways that please you. Lord, please bless Aaron and Nathan as they model godly manhood to their families. As Matt said, Lord, that first preachment of what a father is. <clears throat> Help these men to love their families well, to protect and provide for them and to trust in you. Help them to love their wives well and to lead with wisdom and courage. Lord, provide them with meaningful work and teach them to pray. Lord, please bless Andrea and Cynthia as they serve their families. Help them to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, in these busy days with little ones, when there seems to be little time or energy to pray, Lord, teach them to pray. 
and thank you for hearing the cries of their hearts. Lord, thank you for Alethea and Thomas and Daniel and Lillian. They are precious gifts from you, and we want them all to love you and keep your commandments, help them to learn obedience to their parents and then to you. Lord, make these ones leaders in their generations, ones that love you, seek your face, and bring many to faith in you. Father, thank you for bringing these families to Hope Chapel. Help us as a congregation to support them well, to nurture the faith of their children, help our words as a congregation be supported by our deeds, and help us to faithfully disciple this next generation of Jesus followers. Thank you that these couples want to live lives that honor you. Thank you that they want to raise their children according to your precepts. So Lord, would you hear their prayers and grant their requests and have mercy on them according to your loving kindness? Nathan and Andrea, Aaron and Cynthia, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So we have a small gift for each family, and they are marked by balloons. So the bigger bunch goes to the bigger bunch of kids. And um, thank you guys for participating with us. And thank you, Hope Chapel, for loving our families well. That's all we have. Amen and amen. Lots going on this morning. Hope you can all stay till after service. We have an important lunch. Before that, we have an almost as important sermon. Before that, we have lots of other things to do. So I'm going to get off the stage, and I'm going to ask Melody to lead us with announcements. Let's welcome Melody. Oh, oh here we go. I knew it would turn up. Hi. Good morning, Hope Chapel. That was cool. I don't know if you've ever read an email and read like the top paragraph and you're like, oh, that's a summary of what I'm going to read after. But then later you learn, no, that was just the first paragraph and that means the baby dedication is before announcements. Um, that's what happened. We had a nice whispered conference in the fifth or sixth row, figured that out. Welcome. I'm sure y'all all read your emails perfectly. It's cool. Um, first, very important. There is no junior high this morning. It's usually a junior high morning. So if your junior hire has scuttled off, they are going to encounter a locked door. So maybe they'll come back. Hopefully they'll come back. If they don't, you should probably find them. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Um, welcome. If you are new, go meet someone in the foyer afterwards. They're the ones who signed up to do it. Or you could meet someone just next to you. That works too. Uh, if you're like super shy and you like the digital stuff or you're on the live stream, you can text the word welcome. There's a number. Real person answers that number. It's kind of cool. So if we want to get to know you, share about us, answer your questions, happy to do that. And then if you do call Hope Chapel your home, there's a few ways to give. Uh, I think they're listed, yes. So I'm very caffeinated, but I haven't eaten, so sorry. <laughs> So you can give on Realm. If you're into Realm, you can give through the mail. Um, you can text. A few ways to do that. If you like to do that kind of thing, if you're like, yeah, Hope Chapel's where I'm at, that's the way to do that. Um, I'm just going to pray for us real quick. Thank you. Thank you, God, that you are here, that you are present, that you are bringing your kingdom, and that you are perfect and good even when we are still figuring it out. I pray that this week would be full of your goodness and your mercy for every single person here, that they would turn around and see your goodness and mercy pursuing them, whether that's this week or their entire life, that you would show them where you have been faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now some video, community life updates through video.
Hello. Oh, thanks, Earl. Good morning, Hope Chapel. I'm Ceci, your Go Pastor. And live stream, we are going to cut it real quick because we have some special guests today that we don't want to show on the internet. So it is my.
Is the live stream back? Hello, live stream. We're glad to have you back. <clears throat> Thank you for everybody who's here in person. Yeah, so um, I want to start with something that may be a little odd, and don't worry about the ringing. It's, it's real, right? It's not just in my head. <laughs> um, don't worry about that. We're going to plow, and um, I, I just want you to know that I had a totally different sermon planned months in advance, and I fell ill uh, last week. Last Sunday, I had lots of time to, to kind of sit around. I canceled a lot of meetings and just prayed. And I felt like what I wanted to share was not what God wanted to share. I don't know if you can relate to the idea that prayer is uh, communication with the Lord and he'll speak back. Two words kept coming to mind, always enough. That he is always enough. And I thought, well, there's a lot of verses I could choose. Let's choose some stories. But this is related to something that I've been bringing up for, I believe, weeks now. And I, I, risk, I run the risk of becoming annoying for bringing it up over and over. But I, at some point a month or two ago, I felt the Lord put on my heart an idea that we should now, as a community, Embrace a kind of spiritual aggression to not hide, but to take ground with the Lord. And I have been sharing this because I feel that it is good for us. The war is not against you or me, but the, the influences in the, in the darkness that seeks to destroy us. So let me re-explain for those who may not be familiar. When I say we should engage in spiritual warfare, I mean partnering with God for his kingdom to take territory in our lives, for his glory and our benefit. Some people might think that I'm talking about prayer for lots of money or fancy cars. I don't know what you think. In my mind, I'm thinking about Christ-likeness. I'm thinking about addictions, hope for marriages and family life, people struggling with fear, longing for boldness, or people struggling with bitterness, needing to forgive, and longing to walk in the joy of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the morning's worship, those themes came up as well. God's pursuing us aggressively, but for our good and with his goodness. 
He wants to change our garments of heaviness for garments of praise. And it is the fire of Christ's love that is the fuel for our fight. It is the reward on the other side and is the motivation for starting. But before I start with what God has put on my heart, there's another thing God put on my heart so that we're getting backlogged here. I am sincerely convinced that many of us need to be reminded that we fight from his favor, not for it. A lot of us want to be good Christians. And so we dedicate ourselves to a prayer life for other people, doing things for the Lord. But when God says that he is love, when the Bible tells us that the way he communicates the power of the gospel is by not holding our sins against us and demonstrating his power through raising Jesus from the dead for us and for our salvation, It would be really cool and actually a way to honor him if we just believed it. What I would like for us to do is a, this is how I imagined it happening when I was praying, a corporate time of receiving ministry from the Holy Spirit. We do prayer here after service often with prayer teams. We do prayer during the week, but I would like us to stand If you're with a group of people, you can, I don't know, it's post-COVID. You don't have to hold hands. You could touch shoulders or something. Can we stand, please? And we're going to receive ministry from the Lord. A lot of us love praying for other people. We feel guilty praying for something for ourselves. We love praying and adoring the Lord. But let's just take a moment and let God speak his love to us. God, I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, the love of Christ would burn within us, would blaze all the more, that your love would be made known to us in real ways, that you would transform us by the power of your love, and that Christ would be made manifest to us in our lives. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you love us. Help us believe your love. Lord, I ask you to fill our minds and our, our, the vision of our lives. Fill us with the love of Christ. That you would be the focus Ask the Lord ask that the Lord would rebuke lies from the enemy. Break them off. Let your love burn, Lord. I imagine doing this. I didn't know I didn't imagine an ending to it, so. Can you put your hands on your own heart as well? And then out loud or, 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 or inaudibly, I don't care. Will you confess that you receive his love? I receive your love. Lord, I receive your love, Lord. Gladly. We receive your affection. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, thank you so much for doing that with me. You know, a lot of us who are parents, and you can imagine what even, you don't have to have a kid to imagine this, but 
You know, at Christmas time or their birthday, you celebrate them. And your response isn't, what, you gave me a macaroni picture of a hippo? Looks like a donkey. We love to give gifts to our kids. We love to prop them up, to, to see their joy. Earth isn't heaven's sweatshop. Yeah, he created us to love him, but we love because he loved us first. One of his greatest joys is that he created us to love us. Anyway, when God is impressing upon my heart that he wants to take ground in our lives aggressively, this is what I mean. He's chasing us with his goodness. He's attacking us with his love and affection. He's rescuing us, even when we as the captives often don't know how desperately we want it. So I had been asking that the Lord would highlight to something, something to you in your life that would be an area to take ground. And last week I had suggested, if you can't think of anything, just think of the biggest area of disappointment and failure. Go big. This is motivated by love. I, I want us to experience joyous spiritual warfare. That the oil of gladness would characterize our walk with Christ. But for some, the big things seem unbelievable. It's important to remember that in that, God is enough. What if I told you that for God's plan to take shape, a couple in their 90s would have to get pregnant? Or that a slave would need to rule a nation? Or that the sun might need to stand still? <laughs> what if I told you that a young boy would need to fight and win in combat against a very large, experienced soldier. He has always been enough. He's enough to overcome the fear and doubt of us engaging in joyous warfare. He is enough to overcome potential embarrassments as we walk in that direction. Especially if we struggle with unforgiveness or bitterness. You might, God might highlight to you in your prayers, a person you might need to call. Or he might ask you, who are you avoiding? And he'll give strength, but you might feel embarrassed in your first steps. We're going to see some stories of God being enough, and I hope that this is an encouragement. The first one is in Exodus 17. Starting in verse 1, <clears throat> all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. And, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Some of us think that way about our walk with Christ. Why did you forgive me and redeem me from the powers of darkness just to, just to be here in this weird stuck place? Well, some of us think that way. So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people taking with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff that you, which, which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Okay, he wanted them to confidently believe, believe that he was with them. The question of, well, is he, able, is he among us or not? He actually wants us to be confident that he is with us. <clears throat> he led them into a wilderness place, but then also gave them what they needed. And he's able to do that because his power is unlimited. 
He knew they were in a wilderness place. And he provided. He wanted them to walk in confidence in his presence with them. And what Moses did would have seemed ridiculous. Um, I would love for there to have been local media <laughs> just interviewing Moses on his way to the rock. What's your plan here, sir? I'm going to hit the... I'm going to hit it with a stick. <clears throat> and how do you feel like that's going to work? I'm just going to hit it with a stick. God told me to do it. And God met him there in that embarrassing, awkward place. Could you imagine your whole country watching you hit a rock with a stick? <laughs> the Lord is enough. His power is unlimited. And sometimes he'll ask us to do something that sounds silly. But we do it anyway because he's leading us. Obedience is like a love language to him. Okay, here's another story the, about the indebted widow. It's from 2 Kings 4, verse 1. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. In this story, God, care of the prophet, wanted this lady to take a leap of faith. He could have magically made money appear. Sure. But he asked her to do this thing. It was an act of faith, an act of trusting that God would provide when he said he would. But again, what would it have seemed like if you'd asked her, like, hey, what are you doing with all these vessels? Oh, I, I'm just going to fill them all up with oil. From what? Well, I have a, a little flask in my kitchen. I'm just going to fill them all up. That would have seemed silly. But we know that his power is unlimited. And when he asks us to do something, he'll be there with us when we do it. How much more when we have an area in our heart that's riddled with fear. And he may ask us to step out in faith. And you might think, no, I don't want to talk to that guy. I'll, be, I'll look silly. Well, but he'll meet you there. His power is unlimited. One more story. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, we see Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria. He was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now, the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Oh, would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and, and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go. And I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And when he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when, when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes. And said, am I God 
to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? <clears throat> Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, didn't even come out. <laughs> Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I, I thought that he would surely come out to me and, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand <laughs> over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I, could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned off and went away in rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. According to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Sometimes we have a, a mental block where we think, I, I could have great favor with the Lord were I to have perhaps thousands of talents of silver and gold and give it to him. And maybe changes of clothing as offerings to the Lord. Or maybe if I had some big show of a hullabaloo. What was Naaman actually asked to do? Just dip seven times. That's almost offensive. He came from Syria. He's important. There was no exchange. He didn't have to buy it. It was just free. And it sounded dumb. I already have rivers where I'm from. And your river's dinky. <laughs> but this reminds me of our, the deep wells of salvation we draw from, from Christ our Lord. Hung on a cross for our sins, offering the love of God. He's hanging there naked and shameful. People spit at him and they dressed him up to mock him. You think, I'm struggling with real sin and darkness and, 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 and lots of things in my heart. You want me to go to him? Yeah. There is great power in the Lord, but he doesn't necessarily operate the way our important men here on earth operate. He's humble. And what he asked Naaman to do required humility. And he wants to meet us there with great power. God's power is unlimited. Naaman was asked to do something that didn't cost tons of money. It just cost him some pride. And it would have sounded like a dumb plan. Local media following Naaman, the big important man. What are you doing today, sir? What are you doing here in Israel? Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a bath. Why? Well, I have leprosy. You know that that doesn't wash off, sir? I know. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> I'm actually going to take seven baths, not just one long bath, seven individual baths. Why? Because the prophet told me that obedience in his humility that was probably hard, and the Lord gave him people to remind him, hey, just do it, that obedience in humility was met with great power. Back to the challenge God has given each one of us. Pinpoint an area for surrender in our lives. Not with heaviness, but with eager anticipation that the Lord would move. Let him show you what it is. This is an act of seeking his favor, longing for liberty, and engaging in joyous warfare, knowing that he is always enough. His power is unlimited. He might ask us to do something that's humbling. He might ask us to do something that sounds dumb. Although, we've already known that, 
We've already known that God doesn't place the gospel in the lofty philosophies of the world or the great deeds of men, but in a stumbling block of Christ the Lord crucified for us. The power of God is presented in a stumbling, awkward way that isn't sensible or wise by the worldly standards around us. In our stories, God asked a lady to take a leap of faith to do something that doesn't make sense. And yeah, he could have just magically made money up here, but he asked her to do something, an act of trust. Her jar plan would have sounded silly. Same as Moses hitting a, a stick against a, a rock. That would have sounded dumb. And God could have just poofed the water without a stick display. Or I guess he could have just led them to something that was never a wilderness. He could have led them to the Golden Corral. He led them to a wilderness, but then provided what they needed. Because he, he is their source, and he is always enough. Now, he may have led you to a place in life where you need to lean on him in an area with great faith, but then he's always been enough. None of this spiritual warfare invitation is condemnation. In fact, God wants the prize of communion with us. He wants it more than we do. He longs for intimacy with us more than we do. He longs for great victory in our lives, even more than we do. He hopes when we've lost hope. There's no version of Christianity that does not require supernatural power. No matter what your perspective of church is or what your background is, we all know that we needed the Spirit of God's power to confess that Jesus is Lord. We are walking in a naturally supernatural relationship with Christ. And it isn't just to confess that He is Lord, but to give hope to the hopeless, to give vision to those who are wandering aimlessly, to give sight to the blind health to the broken, and restored relationships to those whose families are fractured. We need the Spirit's power. And the power of Christ is manifested in His love because everything He does is from the character of God, and He is love. Nothing is impossible with Him. Do you feel like He's highlighting a broken relationship and you feel like it's hopeless? It's actually not hopeless. Do you feel like he is offering you a vision of your future that looks like madness because you've always been cowardly and he sees you as bold? Nothing is impossible with God. <clears throat> he wants freedom for us. Are you struggling with an addiction and you tried like motivational videos on YouTube? He wants joy to dominate your life and he wants you to know it was from him. <laughs> okay. If you feel a stirring in your spirit, but you just don't know where to start, here's a good place to start. Pursuing the sacred feeling of the soul. Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, going to him, asking for the transformative power of the love of Christ to burn within you. I'm not talking about a Christianity that just gets you through your Tuesday. I'm talking about a Christianity where the love of Christ burns within you and consumes you. Where we are transformed by his love and affection. And we need help to walk in that. I see proof of that in Ephesians chapter 3. This is kind of how we're going to end. I'm going to read Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And we're going to use these as prayer points in groups here where we're sitting. Starting in verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Faith's an interesting thing. 
A lot of us, you know, he loves us more than we think, so we should just change the way we think. And that would be repentance, and it would look like faith. Okay. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Basically, Paul's saying, I'm praying, I'm on my knees here, praying that the power of God would come upon you so that you could even comprehend his love. It's that big. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So this is for us too. That the glory of Christ would reign even in this generation, for all generations. That that power would still be at work now. The power of God didn't come upon the church just to get things going, and then he's like, all right, I'm out of here, and then you, you just you keep going without me. His power remains in the church, the body of Christ now. You, here, the power of God remains And the focus of this prayer from the Apostle Paul is that we would have the Spirit of God strengthening us just so that we could even try to grasp his love. Here are the prayer points I would like us to pursue. And they're all in the text. And if you want, we're going to pray in just a moment. You can find Ephesians 3. But the prayer points are that that God would strengthen us in our inner beings. That Christ would dwell in our hearts with increasing faith. That we would be empowered by God to grasp the love that we are grounded in. And you think, well, I already believe in the love of Christ. Well, all the more. All the more grow in it. You got room in there for more? Because there's plenty. That we would grow in knowledge of the love of Christ. And that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. So we, um, we may be a little out of practice, and that's kind of because of COVID, but... Um, we used to, we kind of did church for a while where we didn't touch, not much touching. <clears throat> but if you could, in your, in your, wherever you are, so this is, this is a leap of faith again here. We're going to let the, the Spirit guide us. But, you know, not, not like the whole church, but like sections. Can we pray with one another and bless one another along these prayer points? And this is how I'm going to close the service. Um, I may hop back up to remind you, if you're getting carried away and you're praying too much, I might just, just joking. Um, so we could keep the prayer points up for the live stream. I don't know if they're going to be there, whatever, it doesn't matter. But um, at this point, I'm going to do my formal conclusion now because you're all still paying attention to me now. When I say, when we start getting going, you're not going to really be paying attention to me. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and also move this way down the hallway for our special lunch. Now let's pray. <clears throat>